Praise God, that really sets the tone for this whole journey in Hope for the Heart. And so Meg and I began following Jesus as freshmen in college, and she did invite me to my first Christian meeting, uh, and yet very much we were both trying to figure things out at that time. Uh, me, I was coming from a religious background, but my religious background was, was one of ritual without reality. And so even though I could do Christian-looking things, I, I did it without any relationship personally with Christ. And then as I came to college and met Christians who were doing Christian things but actually knew Jesus in their hearts personally, I realized, wow, they have something I don't have. And I began to long for that relationship with Christ. So I came to Jesus by way of John chapter 4, where we see the Samaritan woman and uh, she is, of course, you know, looking for love and meaning to life in all the wrong places. And Jesus offers her the, the life that wells up into eternal life and was deeply satisfied with Christ. And that was part of my journey. Meg, on the other hand, came uh, without much religious background into college, began seeking uh, spiritual things, seeking the Lord. And part of that was she had been suffering with panic anxiety in high school. Uh, she'll describe walking through the halls of her school uh, in high school and needing to touch the walls because she was just nervous to get too far away um, from, from safety in that way. So if you're not familiar with anxiety, perhaps you are and you've had it or you're trying to understand or you're trying to describe it to someone, uh, it's not just worrying, you know, it's just your heart is going crazy, your chest is constricting, and, and, and I kind of describe it as it's like you're getting on a roller coaster, a big, scary roller coaster, imagine that, and you're already nervous, and then you start going up that first incline, you know, and, and your heart's going, and then you realize that your lap bar is not working, and, and now you're screaming for help. Your inevitable doom is, is coming, and you're just inching slowly up that first hill, knowing what's around the corner over that hill. Well, that feeling of screaming inside, you know, whether you're sitting in a church or a living room or a traffic jam, however peaceful or unpeaceful the circumstances may seem, people are screaming inside when they deal with panic anxiety. And so Meg came to Christ by way of Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, which says that Jesus shared in our humanity so that by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. And she would tell her story as, wow, I, I, death was the root of all my fears, but now that I know a resurrected Christ, I have such peace and I have such joy and have such freedom from fear. And so as we began to follow Christ, we started dating about a year after we both came to Christ. We were married right out of um, college, and it just seemed like things were getting better and better. We were growing closer to each other, closer to God. We just felt the best was yet to come still. And so our spiritual life in our minds kind of looked like this arrow on your screen, you know, just going for it, you know, all in, all on fire for Jesus, and things just getting better and better and better. But then we moved here from up north, we moved down to this region of Washington, D.C. to go to seminary. And it was a lot of new stuff, new people, new places, new jobs, new school, right? New church, and plus new pressure. We're trying to go into ministry, and there, you know, some of the pressure associated with that. We're removed from our support network back home. And it also happened to be a season when there's this D.C. sniper terrorizing the area. Remember that? So... Not a good combination for those trying to find peace. And so all of a sudden, Meg began experiencing panic anxiety. Looking back, we know it wasn't so sudden, but it sure felt sudden then. And all of a sudden, this, this young woman that I just thought could conquer the world and travel the world and you know, go on mission all over the world, was doing all these things, was, could not go to the store, could not take a shower, could not focus to read a book. And what amazed me is she could literally be listening to worship music, praying to God, reading from Philippians 4, do not be anxious about anything, and having a panic attack. And so I thought, what happened to my wife? It, what did I do to her? <laughs> did I ruin her? Oh, no. And she thought, what happened to my testimony? 
Because her testimony was, God, deliver me from fear. And now I have peace. And it had been that way for a few years. And so what was her testimony now? Did it count for anything? Who, who was she? Who was Christ? How, how could someone know Christ and live with such debilitating fear when you know the Prince of Peace? How can you be a pastor's wife? And this was the season we began to get into. And, and all of a sudden, we were faced with a journey that looked much more like that second arrow. <laughs> Now, how many of your lives in spiritual life look a little bit more like that one? Anybody want to admit it? I mean, you're kind of trending, sort of becoming more like Christ. There's this thing, progressive sanctification happening, but aren't there some valleys along the way? And what we had to learn, church, at times the hard way, was that God does some of his best work in those valleys, right? The view's nice from the mountaintop, but the green stuff and the good stuff grows down in the valley. That's where God did some of his best work in our lives. And that first year, that was our journey for about a year. And then I'll share you three times after that, extended seasons in the course of our life and ministry of real anxiety, you know, struggling to be in, in church, holding conversation after all these things, you, you know, never think of, of, of Megan. And yet part of the journey that God has used to draw us closer to him and to draw us so much closer to each other. And so now we look back and praise God for his faithfulness. And one thing we've realized is that when you open the Bible and read about the heroes in Scripture, their lives look a lot more like that second arrow than that first one. And we're going to think about David in this season. And David's life looked a lot more like that second arrow. Now, when I say David, okay, what do you think of right away? You think of David and Goliath, mostly 90% Goliath, I heard. And if you had to think of a second story, you'd probably have to think of David and Bathsheba, 90% Bathsheba. We think David, Goliath, that's the high point, and then the valley, the low point, Bathsheba, the sin. But, you know, even he repented from that and got back on track. So David's a really awesome guy after God's own heart, you know, sinned and then got back on track. Oh, my goodness. His life is such a mess. From every page you turn, just valley after valley, God pursuing him in the midst of it. And so that's so much of my hope right there. When I say hope for the heart, it's this. It's that David is more familiar than we realize. That's kind of your first thing. David is more familiar than we realize. Because the sin and the struggle and the suffering that we experience in, in this world is, is what we see in David's life. And that's encouraging because even in the midst of that, God is more faithful than we realize. Because at every valley, at every point, God pursued David. God kept every single promise he ever made to David. And God provided a path for David to respond again to God. You hear that? At every point, God is faithful. And he is for us too. Which means life is more hopeful than we realize. Because of God's faithfulness, we can respond to him as he pursues us. He even gives us simple choices, not necessarily easy choices, but simple choices we can make in our journey in order to respond to him and honor him that grow relationship with him. That's what we're going to think about as we think about hope for the heart. When we come to David, by the way, he becomes the standard for all the kings that follow. Every king after David will be judged by how much like David they were. We've got 66 chapters dedicated to David. More than anybody except Jesus in Scripture is dedicated to David. And 59 New Testament references to David. And one of those references in the book of Acts says the same thing as the Old Testament, that David was a man after God's own heart. See that? Be encouraged that we, in this season, no matter what we're going through, can be people together after God's own heart. Let's pray and ask for God's help to become that, okay? Lord, we just invite you to minister to us through your word. Speak to our hearts. Awaken us to your faithfulness. Lord, convict us where you need to. Have your way in us, I pray, this season, that you would bless even today. Help us to see your word and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. We're in 1 Samuel 16, all right? You're going to see some verses on your screen. You can follow along as well. Verse 1, the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil. Be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. 
But Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. Now, we're kind of jumping into the middle of God's big story, okay? So just for context here, we got to go back. God made some promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, told them that they'd be in the specific land as part of a sign of his faithfulness to them. But they ended up where instead? Egypt. They ended up in Egypt for quite a long time. Finally, God raised up Moses and, and brought them out toward the promised land. But how long did it take them to get to the promised land? 40 years in the desert. So they finally get into the promise. I remember Joshua leads them in. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, right? And the walls came down and the people began to settle into that land that was promised them a great sign of God's faithfulness. And as they do, they need some leadership, some organization. So God raises up what's called judges. We have a whole book in the Bible called Judges, and it's just a story of the leaders that God rose up during this 400-year period where, honestly, it was really messy. I mean, some really ugly stuff in Judges, but God's faithful to raise up again another leader. Usually that leader and the people all together walk away from God, but God pursues again and again. And the last one in line as a judge of Israel is Samuel. So Samuel's kind of leading in Israel at this time. He's kind of also a prophet and a priest. And so, and so he's the leader, and he's troubled He's mourning, we even see, uh, in, in 1 Samuel 15, for Saul, because Samuel's got a, a couple of problems at this point. Number one, if we go back to 1 Samuel 8, when Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders, but his sons did not follow his ways. So the next in line to be leaders, his sons did not walk in the way of the Lord. Well, the, the people see that, and, and they say, come on, Samuel, you're getting old. We don't want to follow your son, so appoint a king to lead us just like all the other nations have. Now, how many, you know, how good of an idea is it to do what everyone else does? Or to want to be like everyone else? How well does that usually end? Well, you know, even if they had some good reasons for, for whining a king in terms of a, a, afraid of, you know, his sons ruling at that time, oh boy. And they rejected God as their king in that process. God was merciful to their heart's desire, gave them a king. Samuel appointed Saul to be king, and that didn't work out so well. And so Samuel now is dealing with the failure of, of, of his sons. He's probably feeling bad about that himself. And also the king he appointed is not working out. And so he's mourning, and he's thinking, that's hard. He's hurting. He's hurting. But notice what God says, how long are you going to mourn? And this is, there's, there's a thing such as godly grief, but this is mourning that's just losing track of who God is because God is a God of new beginnings. And he's about to bring a new beginning through David, but how many of you know the new beginning is not behind you? The new beginning is in front of you. The breakthrough is not back there. The breakthrough is in front of you that God wants to bring. And so he's trying to give a new beginning through David, and that's where we pick up as we continue on. The Lord said... Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice. I'll show you what to do. You do anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. Isn't that a great verse? Samuel did what the Lord said. He's doing good now. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled. When they met him, they asked, do you come in peace? So he was nervous to travel because he's like, well, Saul's going to know if I'm on the move because I'm kind of been the, you know, the leader here as well, and he doesn't want to expose himself. There's this underlying tension throughout the kingdom. You see, you see at this time, because of ungodly leadership, everyone's on eggshells. Everyone's a little, you know, afraid. And yet God says, look, I'm going to cover, I'm going to cover you, man. Like, we're just going to frame this as a sacrifice. You do sacrifices all the time. We'll do a sacrifice. We'll just kind of anoint, you know, the next king while we're at it. How many of you know that God will help you do what he's called you to do? All right? You can find a way to get it done. He's not up there like, yeah, you know, you're right. Gosh, how are we going to do this, Samuel? <laughs> hey, anybody got any, any angels got any ideas? Right? I learned this from this text. He's going to help us to do what he's called us to do. And so Samuel says, yes, I've come in peace. I've come to sacrifice the Lord. Consecrate yourselves. Come sacrifice me. He consecrates Jesse, just part of the, the ritual there, and his sons, and invited them, Jesse's sons, to the sacrifice when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab, and he thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. So it's a little Cinderella scene, like they're looking for the foot that fits the glass slipper, okay? And they're just going to start at the most obvious one and work their way down until Samuel says, yes, that's the one. So they bring out Eliab, right, who's the most obvious one. 
In verse 7, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance. But the Lord looks at what? The heart. Oh, what a verse to memorize. The Lord is looking for the heart. So then they bring the next guy in, Abinadab, and then the next guy, and Sam's like, no, no, no. They bring in all together seven, you know, sons. And, and, and I think Samuel's just, something's not right here. Is there anyone else? Are you hiding anybody from me? Jesse's like, oh, well, there is uh, David. He's tending the sheep. Samuel says, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. The work is not done until this one comes. And so he sent for him and had him brought in. He's glowing with health, had a fine appearance, which is, which is interesting, all right? S strong features don't disqualify you from, from the Lord's ministry. It's just not enough. <laughs> it's not the main thing, right? Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the presence of his brothers, and from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Because God can take that kind of heart and bring his spirit and bring his power to it to do his work. Because, in, you know, your point here is this, that we look for a package. We look for the whole package. God looks for a whole heart. We look for a whole package. We look for the man. We look for the woman. We look for the package. God's looking for the heart. So what are you looking at when you're building friendships, when you're dating, when you're even interviewing people for a job? Are, are, we, are we looking at those obvious qualities that first stand out? Are we looking for the heart? What are we pursuing ourselves? Are we building resume? Or are we building character? Even if it doesn't seem to get us as far at first as a resume, are we willing to build character and not forfeit character in pursuit of resume? Because God's looking for a heart. God's in the heart business. What are we looking for? What are we looking at? I've been blessed to be a part of this preaching cohort this past year. We've gotten together once a quarter with other pastors in the region. And, you know, you, you read books on preaching and you, you talk about, you know, preaching and preparing a message and delivering a message and all the finer points of the craft or whatever. But I was so blessed this past week that we brought, they brought in a senior uh, kind of uh, pastor guy, just a seasoned minister. And for a couple of hours, his, his point to us was this. It's not just about preparing a message. It's about preparing your heart. God doesn't just prepare messages. He prepares men and women to give those messages. And he focuses back on what's going on in your heart, guys. Are you letting God's word speak to your heart, your heart first? Because otherwise, forget about it. We're just kidding ourselves. And I was, I was so blessed by that. It reminded me of 1 Corinthians 1 when Paul writes, Brothers, and sisters, re remember who you were when God called you. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, the weak to shame the strong, the lowly, and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one can boast before him. See, God, God gets more glory when he works this way. When he takes people like David out in the fields. And puts his spirit on them and enables them because it's, it starts with the right heart. Then the boast is in him, right? Then he gets the glory. That's the kind of people God is looking for, the heart that God is looking for. I see it in 2 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9. The eyes of the Lord, hear this, the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth. God's just looking all over to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. God's on a mission trip to find hearts fully committed to him. Not perfect hearts, not perfect people. If, if you're a perfect person, you're in the wrong place, right? But people devoted with effort, with commitment. And when they get it wrong, they come back and try to get it right again with total effort and total commitment. And then what does he do? He strengthens those hearts. He infuses his power into that. It's just, as, it's good old Captain America stuff. 
All right, Steve Rogers from the, the movie was just a scrawny nothing and nobody and bullied and, and he wanted to go serve in World War II if, if anyone recalls the story and, and he was just rejected time and time again because of how he looked and you know, just how pathetic a, a strength that he had. But, but they had some people you know, in the movie that, that knew his heart, that had observed his character, and they said, this is the one we want to give the secret serum to because that serum is going to explode him into this giant of a man, and it's going to magnify all the qualities of his heart. And, and when we come to Christ and commit ourselves fully to him and aim totally devoted to him, God says, yeah, I can work with that. Maybe you're a mess. Maybe you don't even always get it right. Maybe most of the time you don't, but if you'll commit and devote, and come back to me. I can strengthen that. I can work with that. I'm going to get glory because of that. More people are going to know me as a result. Because he strengthens the hearts of those committed to him. So how's our hearts? Because this whole thing presumes that there's kind of good hearts and bad hearts. The kind of good and not so good hearts. And, and Jesus says this in Luke chapter 6. Starting in verse 43, he says, No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its fruit. A good man brings good out of the good stored up in his what? In his heart. And an evil one brings evil out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Right? Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Let's just, let's just think about the heart for a second because, you know, what is the heart? It, biblically, when we're talking about the heart, we're talking about the inner immaterial nature. Sometimes it's called spirit. Sometimes it's called mind. That's your point, is the heart is the inner immaterial nature. It consists of the mind, the emotions, and the will, biblically. So when we say heart, we're talking about, you know, what we're thinking, how we're feeling, and what we're choosing. Those are all activities of a biblical heart. This is not pumping organ physical stuff. This is immaterial nature. All right? God says that out of the overflow of, of that, of that thinking and feeling and choosing, out of that, we have this overflow. Okay? Out of that, the mouth speaks. <clears throat> we have these behaviors that start showing up. <clears throat> and we can almost draw a tree. All right? Let's just pretend that's a tree. I mean, you don't really have to pretend because it's so well done, but, <clears throat> okay? But <clears throat> we have a heart overflowing to a tree. It, and the idea is the heart is the control center. It's the control center for our behavior. So in parenting, for example, we talk about shepherding a child's heart, okay? So if my child were to do, not, not, not this ever happens, actually, but... <laughs> Hypothetically speaking, like, if, you, if you're coming over today, just no promises, though, all right? <laughs> but if, if my child is mean to my other child, all right, if he's mean to her, I'm going to say to her, why were you mean to him? And what's she going to say? She's going to say, I was mean to him because, because he was mean to me. And I say, well, why are you mean to him? And what's she going to say? Because he was mean to me. And, and they're dealing with, responding to each other's behaviors. And I can say, stop being mean to him and stop being mean to her. And here's, you know, the six ways that we're going to correct your behavior. We're going to do some discipline and some rewards and all this stuff. And we do all of that. Like, we try to do all of that. But if we don't get to the heart, we're kidding ourselves because the roots go deeper than the behaviors. We got to think, why did you do that? How can we help your heart to love God so much that in the next situation, instead of sinning against God to be mean, you're going to be like, ah, wait a minute, God, I love you, so I'm not going to do that even though I want to. Do you see the difference? And, and the heart controls that response. And we're not just a slave to whatever's been done to us, but we can, we can respond in right ways to God. Okay, so, and, and that's real stuff. Like, there's real stuff happening to us, influencing us. I'm drawing arrows toward the heart because there's real influential factors in our hearts and lives. 
Okay, sometimes in psychology it's called nature and nurture, and you know, what influences what more, nature or nurture, you call it circumstance, you call it your own past decision, whatever it is. And here's what I love about the Bible. The Bible never says, well, none of that's a big deal. The Bible never says, oh, just pray that stuff away. The, the Bible deals with the complexity of those problems. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. You will have trouble. That's a promise. There's going to be stuff pressing in on our hearts. It's going to make it hard. But then he says, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Okay? I have overcome the world. Which, which means that we can overcome also through Christ. And this is radical radical stuff because it suggests that this heart is not just a product of whatever's been done to us. We're not just the product of whatever people have done, of our circumstances, of our own past choices. This heart is a processor. This heart processes life and spits out a response one way or the other. And it's either going to be a response toward God that honors God it's going to be a response in another direction altogether that looks to worship something else altogether. But the heart is a processor. It's going to process that and respond. Which means the heart is, we'd say, active, fruitful, and dynamic. It's not just passive. It's, it's not a helpless victim of whatever's been done or whatever I've done. It's active, it's process, it's fruitful. It's going to bear fruit one way or the other. And it's dynamic, which means, guess what? It can change. We can change. We, we can do better than cope. Just make the most of whatever hand we've been dealt. We can have hope because Jesus is part of our hand. That's radical. That's different. But that's real hope that God, that God wants to give us. So now what does this look like? Right? And how do we become a man after, after God's heart, like, like David? David, by the way, who had some of the same factors going on in his life as his brothers, right, but still was able to grow a heart that God saw, right? What about us? So, sometimes you compare David and Saul, and it's a fan, fantastic study to do. So you know, we're just kind of laying some groundwork here, and, and now I kind of want to you know, bring this to con conclusion, some, some ideas here to think about. But this is going to frame a lot of this series, you know, as we think about the heart. But as we compare David and Saul, we think of Saul. You know, Saul was a worrier and David was a worshiper. And Saul was paranoid and David had, had peace. And Saul was all about himself and David was all about, about God. And yeah, you can do that. And, and it's not even always true in, in different seasons perfectly. But here's what I see. I see as I read these stories of Scripture, David was responsive to God. And Saul just wasn't. David had cultivated a responsiveness of his heart. And, and he, so that even in season, he went long seasons without responding to God in right ways. But eventually his heart woke up and responded to God as God continued to pursue him. There was a responsiveness, not a perfectness, a, a responsiveness to the Lord. Well, what did that look like? Well, in Saul's life, that, that response, and this is like 1, Corinthians, or 1 Chronicles 10, it said, Saul died because he was unfaithful to the Lord. This is Saul's kind of final word. He did not keep the word of the Lord and even consulted a medium for guidance and did not inquire of the Lord. See, he was not responding to God's word. He was trying to figure it out his own way. And he was not checking in with God and allowing God to be the king of his life. David, on the other hand, what does responsiveness look like? And, and I just want to look at three ways that I would see responsiveness in David already. And the first is this. He's faithful in his field. He's faithful in his field. Be faithful in your field. God chose David, his servant. He took him from the sheep pens, right? Where was he? Shepherding out in the field. It, when he kills Goliath, he said, I've already done this. I've, I've killed a lion. I've killed a bear. I'm ready. Why? Because he's been faithful in his field. When Samuel rolls into town, and by the way, remember, they were worried everyone would see because everyone would see Samuel rolling into town, and, and all the other guys line up to show their status, right, when Samuel rolls into town. And wait, where's, where's David? Where's da anybody, anybody seen David? David, he's out in the field. He's being faithful in his field when he, when he could be pushing for status. 
I don't know what your field looks like right now, but probably a lot of us don't quite have the job that we'd want. We don't quite have the relationship that we want. We don't quite have the family situation that we want. We might not quite have the health even that we want. We might be having some real trials going on. Worship God anyway. Focus on what you can do. Wake up and look for his fingerprints on every day. As you're faithful in your field, God's going to go to work, and that work won't just be for your promotion. It'll first be for your perfection. And what I mean by that, he's going to make you more like Jesus, more like Jesus in that field. So let's be faithful. Let's be faithful in our field. Another thing I see in David, let's build integrity over image. Oh, we live in a world of image. But David shepherded them with integrity of heart. That's Psalm 78. Integrity means there's a wholeness to who we are. We're not living double lives. There's an integrity to who we are. And we, we announced last week, we're so excited. God's provided through a, a special gift. We're going to upgrade this room. New carpet, new seating, new lighting. In time as God leads, we're excited about that. It's happening. We got to be careful with that, right? Because we could worship in a really awesome facility and already do by many standards and lose track of our hearts, right? And make this all about image? Oh, come on. Come on. Because Satan's at work too and he's coming for our hearts and he loves to do it in seasons like that. And there's churches that are way less resourced than us that God's seeing and saying, that's a heart I want to strengthen, And so where will our hearts be in this process? Let's be concerned for that too. And please, if the people of God can't get real in the house of God with the people of God, where can we get real? Let's not come in here and try to protect our image and convince everyone we're doing better than we are. See, that's one thing David doesn't do. He gets into spats of it. (laughs) But he's a pretty real guy. His psalms, pretty real. How real are your psalms? Do people know what you're struggling with? Man, I'm praying that this season is a season where we could get real with each other. What would that look like for you? And lastly, David related closely with God. David relates closely with God. Now now listen to this. I've been waiting to read these verses to you for a long time. It's been the cry of my heart, okay? Psalm 89 talks, refers back to David, says, he, David, will call out to me, you are my father, my God, the rock, my savior. Let's just say that together. You are my Father, my God, my Rock, Savior. We're familiar with the term Father for God, but in the entire Old Testament, the word Father is used for God only 15 times. This is the only time when an individual calls God Father. Sure, he he was a mess, right? but he knew what it was to relate intimately with God. That's what God's looking for. People that would relate intimately with him. And even when they get it wrong, because what's the heart of a father when you get it wrong? It's, come on, pick them back up. Let's go. I love you. And if it hasn't been your experience with a father, then welcome to the kingdom of God, because that's how the heavenly father works. He'll call out to me, my God. I want to share with you about Saul. Saul, when, when, when he was exposed for his sin in 1 Samuel 15, he says, I have sinned, but please, Samuel, honor me. Don't, don't strip my honor away. Come with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. Do you hear Saul's heart? I've sinned, but I want to go worship the Lord your God. 
Do you hear it? The Lord, what? Your God. He wasn't Saul's God. Saul was around the people of God. But he still called their God, their God. And David knew God as my God. And it breaks the heart of God when we hang around the people of God and appreciate the God of those people and don't come into relationship with that God because he just wants you to trust him and enter relationship with him. He's not interested in all that other stuff that comes with this thing called church. He's pursuing relationship, first and foremost. You are my father, my God. Are you in relationship with God? And then even when the trials come, does he back away? No, the rock, my savior, my savior. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my light. The Lord is my salvation. Read the Psalms. He walked with God, and God walked with him, no matter how many times he messed it up. Maybe you're here today, and you feel like you've just messed up too much, and you have no place in God's family. That is a lie from the pit of hell. Jesus made a place for you at his table, and nothing can take it away. He simply invites you to sit down at the table to trust in him as your savior, to admit your sin and separation from him, believe that he died for your sin and rose again, and to sit down at his table and trust in him to give you eternal life and forgiveness of sins. Maybe some of us need to do that right now. Maybe, right, let's just bow our, let's just bow our heads. I wasn't gonna close this way, but let's just bow our heads. Maybe right now, maybe you don't know God in this way, you know things of God, but you don't know God personally, would you just right now tell Jesus, I admit my sin, I believe you died for me, I believe you rose again, I call on you to save me. I admit my sin, I admit my mess, I believe you love me, I believe you died for me in my place. I believe you rose again. Jesus, I trust in you. Save my soul. Save my heart. If that's your prayer as best you know how, if that expresses your heart, you are, you are welcome into God's family. Maybe you're, maybe you're here today and you just feel like you've gone too far. And would, would you just even today just say to God, hey, I'm listening. <laughs> Even if you don't make it all the way back home yet, would you just say to him, hey, God, I'm convinced I need to look your way again. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to journey with this season here at Forsey and, and hear what you have to say to my heart. Or say to him whatever you need to. But let's all say together, repeat after me. Let's say those words of Psalm Chapter 89, repeat after me. You are my Father, my God, the Rock, my Savior. Let's just say it together all in one. You are my Father, my God, the Rock, my Savior. In Jesus' name.